Today we're going to be covering the first lesson in Unit 1 for SCH4U, which is an introduction to alkanes. Organic chemistry is the study of carbon-containing compounds. Carbon is a fundamental element on the planet because of its unique properties. Primarily, carbon can form up to four covalent bonds, which allows it to act as a backbone in a variety of molecules that can vary in their shape and size. Primarily, the main two structures that we see are chains and rings. The most basic organic molecules are called alkanes, which consist of a carbon backbone bonded to a bunch of hydrogen molecules. They are classified as saturated hydrocarbons because they consist of only single bonds, which means each carbon is going to be connected to four different atoms. In general, the chemical formula for alkanes can be described as CnH2n plus 2, where n is an integer. The suffix for alkanes is ane or ane. Now, in general, there are going to be three different ways that we depict these molecules. The first is the ball and stick model. It's a 3D representation of the molecule, and it more clearly shows the bond angle between the atoms. Second, we have a structural formula. It's a 2D representation, and we use the lines to represent the bonds, a single bond between each element. Last, we have the line diagram. It is the simplest of the three, where instead of writing out the carbon symbol, we just represent it by the point where each line intersects and the two ends. The bond between carbon and hydrogen is omitted as we already assume that it's there. The difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen is 0.4, which is pretty low, so it's classified as nonpolar. Since it's nonpolar, we know that the only intermolecular force that exists between these atoms are London dispersion forces, or LDFs, which are the weakest of their type. So it also makes sense that they have low melting and boiling points. These temperatures that they melt or boil at will increase with chain length because when you add more atoms, there's going to be more bonds to overcome and break apart, so you'll just need more energy. As for alkane reactions, alkanes are fairly unreactive, but they are still combustible because they are hydrocarbons. As a result, they can undergo complete combustion when they react in the presence of oxygen gas. Here we have an example of the combustion of propane. When propane reacts with oxygen gas, as with any uh, combustion reaction, it's going to release CO2 and H2O, or water. So structural isomerism is a new concept we're going to introduce in organic chemistry. Structural isomers start to happen when the carbon chain becomes longer than four carbons. Structural isomers have the same chemical formula as each other, but they have different connectivities, which results in a different structure entirely. It's important to realize that structure is closely related to a molecule's property. For that reason, each isomer is going to have its own distinct properties. Let's look at this through pentane. Pentane has three possible isomers, pentane, 2-methylbutane, and 2,2-dimethylpropane. They all consist of the same chemical formula, C5H12, but now let's take a look at their boiling point. As you can see, they all vary greatly in at what point they're going to become a gas. Pentane, which has the longest carbon chain, also has the highest boiling point, which is related to the fact that it is more accessible uh, to other molecules and can therefore form more bonds, since it does have the longest continuous chain with no branches. On the other hand, we have 2,2-dimethylpropane, which has a lot more branches, which reduces its accessibility, and it can't form more bonds. And remember, the more bonds you have, the stronger your molecule is. As a result, it takes less energy for it to become a gas, and that's why its boiling point is so low compared to its isomer. So being able to recognize and name molecules is fundamental to this course. So this is gonna be a general guideline for naming organic compounds. First, you're gonna to wanna to identify the parent chain. 
The parent chain is the longest continuous carbon chain in the structure, and it's going to affect what prefix you are going to use. I've included a list of prefixes that correspond to the chain length, and this should be something that you get comfortable recalling because you're going to have to use these prefixes quite a bit in this course. Second, you're going to want to identify if there are any substituent groups connected to the parent chain and which carbon they're attached to. A substituent group is an atom other than hydrogen that is bonded to a carbon in the parent chain, and it does affect the molecule's properties. Third, we're going to want to number the parent chain so that the substituents are bonded to the carbon with the lowest number. In a chain, there's going to be two ends uh, that you can begin numbering from. And for proper naming, you'll want to pick the end where the first substituent you encounter is connected to the carbon with the smallest number. If there's a tie, so say there's two substituents connected to the same carbon number on both ends, then priority is going to go to whichever group comes first alphabetically. Fourth, when naming, you're going to want to use plural prefixes if there are two or more of the same substituent present. Fifth, when assembling the name, you want to list all the substituents and their carbon numbers they're attached to first, and these groups are going to be arranged alphabetically. If there's a plural prefix, just ignore that prefix and focus on the first letter of the actual substituent group. Now, this won't always correspond to the numerical order, but that's fine. You're going to want to stick with the alphabetical order. Sixth, between each word and number, you're going to separate it with the hyphen, whereas if you have multiple numbers in a series, you're going to want to separate it with a comma. And finally, the name is going to end with the prefix for your parent chain, as stated above, and the functional group suffix. For alkanes, if there's no other functional groups, then you're just going to use the standard ending A and E, anes. So here we have our first example. It's a little more basic, but we are going to increase in difficulty. So what you want to do first is identify the parent chain. It's a little more obvious here, but you should still make a practice of counting the number of carbons in the chain to ensure that you do in fact have the longest continuous chain that there is. So here, we identify that this is the carbon parent chain, and there is six carbons, so we're going to use the prefix hex. Next, we want to identify if there's any substituent groups. On this one, there is none, so we don't have to worry about that. There's also no other functional groups to use, so we're just going to use this uh, suffix for alkanes. When we combine all this information, we get that the IUPAC name is hexane. Alkyl groups are one of the more common substituent groups that you're going to come across in organic chemistry. They are like smaller branches of alkanes that stem off of the parent chain. And this is where you have to be careful when identifying the parent chain as they can often mislead you since there will now be multiple carbon chains that could be the parent chain. Just remember, the longest chain is always the parent chain. So if you're not sure, remember to count your carbons that are in a continuous sequence. When naming, they use the same prefixes that we stated before, but they have a YL ending now. I've also included some really common alkyl groups. The first three especially, so methyl, ethyl, and propyl are very common on tests and assignments, so you should definitely be comfortable recognizing and naming all of these groups. I've also included an example where we now must consider the alkyl groups. So the first thing we need to do is identify the parent chain. Now we have to be careful here because there is more than one possibility, but when you count the number of carbons, you're going to find that the parent chain has five carbons in it. So we're going to use the prefix pent. Next, we're going to want to identify the substituent groups. Here we have two methyl groups, which are acyl groups that I previously mentioned. And since there's two of the same group, we're going to want to use the di prefix in our IUPAC naming. Next, we're going to want to number our carbon chain so that the substituents start on the carbon with the lower number. Now, we can either start from the left end or the right end. Here, it would make more sense to start from the left end because, as you'll see, 
that means the first substituent is going to end up on carbon 2. Whereas if we had flipped it, the first substituent would end up on carbon 3. 2 beats 3 because it's lower number. So that's how this chain is going to be numbered now. And when we combine all that information, we get that the final IUPAC name is 2,3-dimethylpentane. So next up we have cyclic alkanes. Cyclic alkanes still consist of the same carbon backbone that we saw in the chains before, except now the carbon chains have connected to form a ring structure, so there's no more ends. The general formula for a cycloalkane is CnH2n, and notice that each carbon can only form bonds with two other atoms. In terms of naming, they're named similarly to alkanes, where they use the same prefixes, but to indicate that it's a cyclic structure, we have to add cyclo before the prefix for the parent chain. So here's an example for naming cyclic alkanes. So we're going to first want to identify the parent chain. The parent chain here is the cyclic structure, and if you count, we have six carbons present. So we're going to use the prefix hex for this. Next, we're going to want to identify the substituent groups. There are two substituent groups here, an ethyl group and a methyl group. Now, next we're going to want to number it so that the substituents are attached to the carbon with the lowest number. With ring structures, you have the advantage that there are no ends, so carbon 1 can simply be the carbon already attached to a substituent. But you still want to ensure that the next substituent, if there is one, is going to be attached to the carbon with the lowest number. So here we could go two directions. It makes more sense to go to the direction where the methyl group ends up being connected to carbon 3, as opposed to the other way around where it would be connected to carbon 5. And now that we have all that information, we can once again combine it so that we have the final IUPAC name of 1-ethyl-3-methyl-cyclohexane. We also have alkyl halides, which are just alkane structures that have halogens connected to them. So, halogens can also act as substituent groups in organic compounds, and these include everything in group 17 of the periodic table, so fluorine, chlorine, bromine, iodine, all those elements. When we name alkyl halides, we are going to use the root of the word, but instead we're going to replace its ending with the suffix of O. So if we took iodine, for example, in an organic compound, we would just list it as iodo. Halogens also have high electronegativities, which makes the molecule more polar because the difference is going to be greater. As a result, you can expect that these molecules will have higher boiling points and they also will be more reactive. Now, alkyl halides can be formed through substitution reactions, where a halogen will replace a pre-existing hydrogen atom. There can be multiple halogens on one compound, but right now we're just going to look at it as one halogen is added as a, at a time. So here we have a reaction between butane and bromine gas, where, as you can see, the bromine basically evicted one of the hydrogens, and it formed two bromobutane and hydrogen bromide, or hydrobromic acid. And so here's an example for naming an alkyl halide. So first we want to identify the parent chain. Here there's only one option, it's going to be the five-membered ring. So we're going to use the prefix pent for this situation. Next we're going to want to identify the substituent groups. So here we can see that we have three chlorine atoms attached to the ring. And remember, since there's more than one of the chlorines, we're going to want to use the tri prefix. Next, we want to number the carbon so that the substituents are connected to the carbon with the lowest number. The most ideal situation is if you name them where each chlorine is attached to carbon 1, 2, and 3. It doesn't matter if you start with the chlorine on the left or the chlorine on the right because they're going to lead to the same result, so it's fine. Next, you want to combine all this information, and so the final IUPAC name will be 1,2,3-trichloralcyclopentane. So now I want to end on an example where we're asked to draw the alkane instead of naming it. 
Now we should really let the name of the molecules guide us to how our final structure should look. So here I'm just going to use 2,4-dibromo-6-isopropyl octane. Now first, let's identify what the parent chain is. It's given right at the end, so we know that there is going to be eight carbons in the parent chain. Our final structure for that part of the name will look something similar to what's at the bottom. Next, we're going to add in our substituent groups. First, we see that we have two bromines at the two and four position. So we can add those in just like that. Now, I included them on the left side. You can include them on the right side as long as they're consistent with your numbering either way will be technically correct. And finally, we're gonna to wanna to add in the six isopropyl. So it's the isopropyl at the six position. And just like that, we've now included all of the substituents, we have our parent chain, and so the drawing of the molecule is complete.